Hello, friends, and welcome back to Xing the Gap. It's back to school time, as today's two guests are Linda Schuyler and Sarah Waysglass. Linda is a Canadian television producer best known for co-creating the award-winning Degrassi franchise, which spans five series over four decades. She's a member of the Order of Canada and Order of Ontario, and has recently written a memoir entitled The Mother of All Degrassi. Sarah is a Canadian actress who co-starred as Frankie Hollingsworth in Degrassi The Next Generation, as a Robin in the film Mary Goes Round, and most recently as Maxine in the Netflix drama Ginny and Georgia. In our study group, we cover the multi-generational impact of Degrassi, age-appropriate casting, the space between the sensational and the trivial, learning from mistakes and failure, fearing the future, living in the present, acceptance and tolerance in young people today, teachers that change your life, latchkey kids, helicopter parents, voicing both sides of the story, and a quiz show. Sarah, famous comedy duo that sprung from that show, SCTV, Bob and Doug. Junior. <laughs> Junior, I love it, Linda. Mackenzie. Mackenzie, ding. Saved by the bell. Xing the Gap. Linda Schuyler, Sarah Waysglass, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for the invite. For those of you who may not have read Linda's terrific memoir, uh, The Mother of All Degrassi, or seen Sarah on <laughs> in Degrassi Next Class, as well as Ginny and Georgia and other shows you've done, can you please give me just a little uh, kind of elevator pitch, who you are, what's your story, what do you tell people who don't know you? So maybe we'll start with, uh, we'll start with you, Sarah. Okay. Um, I'm Sarah Waysglass. I'm in my mid twenties and I'm Kenzie. a Toronto based. Yeah, I guess I'm a Toronto based actress. I've been doing it for 17 years. So I really did grow up in this industry. Um, the thing that pe most people know me from is Ginny and Georgia and Degrassi. I, I get like a very similar amount of people recognizing me from both, which is really cool. Um, yeah, I love this industry with all my heart. I don't, think I could do anything else. I just love the people and I love the art so much. And that's kind of why I'm in it and why I'm going to stay in it until I die. <laughs> Which we hope will be a long, long way away. Correct. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Appreciate that. And Linda. Well, I'm Linda Schuyler. And for the last almost 40 years of my professional life, I have been the co-creator and uh, producer, executive producer of all the incarnations of the Degrassi series, which started on air in 1979. Uh, but prior to that, I was a um, junior high school teacher for eight years. And it was really a lot of the experiences that I had as a junior high school teacher that made me realize that, that young people at that particular age in their life need a voice and they need somebody to advocate for them. And um, so it was that I realized was a gap in the media at the time. And Degrassi was created to fill that gap. Right. You, I read in your book that there was this, this sense of you are not alone being such a key message to the whole thing. And, and Sarah, just because you intersected in one of those generations, it was, I think, the most recent one, right? Or was yes. it? So, uh, like, I just talked to someone yesterday who I was mentioning this interview today, and they said they started singing a Zit Remedy song, which <laughs> I thought, that is just a remarkable thing, because it's, you know, I connected to Degrassi on a certain level. I was not an obsessive fan. It had probably has something to do with the age that I was when the show came out. But Sarah, you, you connected with this show at a certain age. What was your experience in those Degrassi? years because it was an adjunct to your time in high school, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's impossible to summarize what a huge impact Degrassi has had on my life and how monumental those four years were to me because I did get cast the summer of my grade nine year. So like I literally was a freshman at Degrassi when I was a freshman in high school. Um, and then I did four years. And so it was like, I'd go to my regular high school and then in the summer I'd go to Degrassi and it felt like my real high school experience. I feel like I had way more fun <laughs> at Degrassi than I did in my real school. Um, and I just remember like something that I had recognized in myself early on in my career was that it felt like work because I was always playing the daughter or the little sister or something like that. And Degrassi was the first time where I got to work with peers 
And I got to work with a bunch of people who were my age and we were all telling stories that were things that were happening in our real lives. It felt very meaningful and it gave me some of my best friends. It taught me so much about the craft and introduced me to such lovely people behind the scenes. Um, there's really just not enough beautiful things I can say about it. <laughs> And Linda, why was why was age appropriate casting so important to you? Like, I get it. I, I love doing shows when I do animated shows with young people. I think it's great when you have kids speaking as kids. Why was that important to you? Well, as I said earlier, it was important for me to to have a voice for young people that was going to be um, an authentic voice. And it's really interesting. You know, I understand why producers don't cast age appropriate. Because if you are a producer and you've got uh, somebody to be 15, you can find people who are 25 years old who look 15. And if you do that, <laughs> it's a lot easier because they can work a full day. They don't have to have chaperones with them. So it's not um, it, it's not an easy way out to, to cast age appropriate. But what I would like to say about that Fifth, that 25 year old who's playing 15, they might look 15. They might have the words to sound like a 15 year old because we've given them the script. But when the camera is on their face, they have 10 years of life experience that is just one of those things that belies the truth of them being a real 15 year old. So that's why I stuck to my guns all these years. You know, in theater, which is mostly my world and where you and I recently intersected, Linda, you know, I played Danny in Greece at an age that was completely inappropriate to play Danny in Greece, the way so many people do, right? You you know, you're a 35 year old doing Ramalama Ding Dong in the high school dance. <laughs> and, you know, it's such a weird thing we do. And yet I think the TV and the proximity of that screen and that camera, it, it, it just reveals much more than a theater um, distance might. And so I guess you can see that through the camera. And I guess you became so good at being able on your end, Sarah, to, to be aware of that camera and then forget about it. But on your end, Linda, of just being aware that everything that comes across has to be authentic and not sensationalized. And, and that's, I'm glad you used that word, not sensationalized, because we really did try to keep our topics au courant. Um, but doesn't mean that we were just doing rip from the headlines for the sake of sensationalism. And when we won our uh, Peabody Award, they gave a citation that to me was like just bang on for Degrassi because they were talking about the um, episode that we had done with a transgender character. And they said what Degrassi did was neither sensationalize nor trivialize. And the, the, the subject matter. And I think it's really important to think of both ends of the spectrum because it's easy to go sensational. And on the other hand, you know, you, it's not fair to go trivial because if you're going to say to young people, oh, OK, you're you're a bit worried about your body image. Don't worry, you'll get over it. So it's finding that space between the sensational and the trivial, that is really where Degrassi finds its narrative lane. Sensational. It's the kind of word that a TV or theater producer will pull out of a review to help sell a show. Sensational, capital letters, exclamation point. That's good, it means something's exciting. It stimulates the senses. These days, it's mostly used in it. These days, it's mostly used in its negative connotation. Sensational means something is exciting, but not necessarily accurate and probably not helpful. In the last 30 years, media outlets have turned sensationalizing into a business model, and it's been incredibly harmful to the information landscape out there and in here, in our heads. Most of us, especially young people, are overstimulated, outraged, and afraid of what lies ahead as if growing up isn't hard enough. So I'll ask you, maybe starting with you, Sarah, what would you say to a room full of young students who are afraid of failure? What, what kind of advice would you give to them based on your own lived experience? Ooh, that is tough. tough. Love that you keep just putting me on first. That's great. Less time to think <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, I would say loving the journey is like learning to love the journey is one of the best parts. Um, because if you aren't thinking about an end product and you're just enjoying where you're at and being present and just 
being grateful for every opportunity that you get to enjoy, that's where you succeed. That's where you get to build this beautiful, like, I kind of want to say like mosaic of memories. And if you fail at the end, so what? Like that's taught you something as well. I think learning from mistakes is one of the biggest things in the world. That was another thing I loved about being on Degrassi is that all of the kids made mistakes all the time (laughs) and handled things incorrectly and then corrected course. So like, I, I just feel like failure is something that is really constructive and can push us to be even better versions of ourselves. So I would say, don't be afraid of it. That's terrific. Linda, I'm sure you've got something to add, but by the way, I ask sometimes young people first because uh, you want the, that the fresh wis- answer. <laughs> I know. I think the wisdom of youth, we talk a lot about the wisdom of our elders. And I think on a certain sense, I don't think we speak a lot about the wisdom of youth. And I know Degrassi is one of those shows that honored that incredibly. Mm-hmm. So, so Linda, how would you speak? You've probably spoken about this very topic. Well, I, I love how you introduced the topic of failure because we have to embrace the fact that we're all going to fail. And if we don't set ourselves, if we don't take risks, then what we do is we stand to put ourselves to actually eventually paralyze ourselves. Because if we are looking for the perfect success, and I see this actually with young people with the posts that they put on their um, social media accounts, they they get so idealized that and they they're so over curated that then they feel they can't even live up to what they're putting out to the world and the other people around them feel well i don't look as pretty as her or as beautiful as her so everybody reaches a point where you can actually become paralyzed for fear of not being successful and and we have to get over that and and we have to embrace the fact that f- failure is painful but failure is also an incredible teacher and and we need to embrace it Wisdom on both ends. And I love it when we can learn from each other. That's part of why this podcast exists. And uh, Linda, I'll start with you this time just to make Sarah happy. This is a a podcast that's an an extension of the the shows that I perform on stage. Uh, You saw part two of this Boom Trilogy, which was uh, the one that was most personal to me because it was autobiographical and based around my own experience as a Gen X growing up in Montreal at the intersection of two cultures, English and French. Uh, between two massive generations of boomers and, you know, millennials and Gen Z. And so after documenting the lives of other people for four decades, you've recently had to reflect on your own life. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, I I suspect it was as hard for you as it was for me to do, to turn the lens and the camera onto yourself. Am I correct? Well, first of all, I have to tell you how much I thoroughly enjoyed your show when I um, saw it a couple of weeks ago. But I actually was a when as I was an audience member, it, it was very interesting for me what you were doing because you had you had the headlines was what was making news of the day. You understood the musical influences that were happening in the day. And then you told us where you were and never in a straight narrative, but you you let us know where you were in time with these political influences, musical inter- influences, art. And I felt very at home in that space because as I started to try and tell my own story, I realized I couldn't, I couldn't distinguish my story from what was happening in society at the time. Um, and the other influences that, that were there. And at the same time, it was easier to look outside and see the other influences than it is to take a hard look inside and see how how was I really thinking? How was I really working when I was a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old? Because my book spans 70 years of my life. <laughs> it was no small undertaking, let me tell you. <laughs> no doubt. And by the way, it's a terrific read. I, I was, I'm not only a fan of that work, but now I'm a fan of your writing. It's very accessible and you talked about creating a space where you felt comfortable. I felt very comfortable flipping the pages and I, I managed to read it in two days, which is very quick for me because I don't often take much time. These days, I don't take much enough time to read, to sit down and go, this is what I'm doing right now. And I did it. And that was partly a testament to your writing and I'm sure the many people who contributed to the book. So congrats to that. 
Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so, Sarah, I kind of have a related question, not about your autobiography, because I imagine you don't have the, you know, Brittany, the life thus far kind of, you know, story going <laughs> on yet. So. Um, no. so I have two daughters who are, are younger than you, but they're, they probably share some of your generation's very valid concerns around, you know, the world that you're inheriting from us. And as we speak today, uh, wildfires across Canada have added like very literal meaning to this sense that uh, <laughs> the world's burning up. And so whether it's the climate emergency or species extinction or the war in Ukraine or AI taking over the world. And yet, like as a 13 year old in 1983, and I, I detail this in my show, I thought the world was going to blow up and it didn't. We somehow made it through. Right. And I still feel like today we're somehow going to make it through. What is your perspective, Sarah, as, as a young person on the sort of climate of doom and gloom that I feel emanates from a lot of your peers? I would say the only thing coming to my mind is I'm terrified. And I think a lot of us are. Um, but what I will say and something I'm really proud of with my generation is how accepting and willing to learn we are. Um, I feel like I learn something new from my peers every single day. And I feel like we're constantly trying ways to make sure that language is accessible and that no one's excluded. And that's a really beautiful thing that I'm excited to be part of. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the disasters in the world, I'm really, really terrified and I don't want the world to blow up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I'm living presently, you know? Yeah. <laughs> The present. The human mind is like a time machine, constantly spinning us to the past and the future, and for some reason it's terrible at focusing on the present. And in genuinely terrifying times, there's nothing more crucial to our well-being than the present moment. In each moment, we're given the chance to connect with the sights, sounds, and sensations that actually make up the character of our lives. But if we let our mind spin freely, it spins fear, doubt, regret, resentment, all of which take us out of the present. Sure, it's an evolutionary advantage to reflect on the past and imagine the future, but only if it gives us perspective, not if it paralyzes us. Linda, I know in all of the many Degrassi's, you were not necessarily ripping from the headlines, as you say, but you were very conscious of what young people were concerned about, their hopes, their anxieties, their aspirations too. What is your perspective now as someone who has seen a lot of this and is living this right now? Well, first of all, I just want to um, pick up on Sarah's comments and I love her acknowledgement that their generation right now is so much more aware than my generation was and even the intermediary ones are just about acceptance of individual differences, of inclusion, because those were key messages to Degrassi way back when. And when, when we had my book launch, I don't know if you met Dio a day there, Sarah. Um, I don't think so. Anyway, he paid BLT in the original show. <laughs> he came up and he gave me a great big bear hug. And he said, Linda, my darling, do you know you were doing equity and inclusion <laughs> and the diversity long before people knew what those words were? And, and it's true. We didn't talk about it in those days. In fact, in my book, I talk about how my parents thought, you know, it, if I was dating, we went to the Presbyterian church and it was okay if I dated somebody who was um, from the United church or even from the Anglican church, but they didn't want me dating anybody from the Catholic church. And we didn't even talk about what it might be like if I wanted to have a Jewish boyfriend, because that just wasn't discussed in Paris. Boy, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so I love your generation so much because I love how that is part of the fabric and it is part of how you think. And so I know there's doom and gloom out there. I think I was brought up in the days when the NFB were producing films about duck and cover. If you hear air raid sirens, go under your desk and but cover your head. There's always threats. And I'm not, don't mean to diminish the threats that are happening now because we have very, very serious threats. But you talking about the, the acceptance, the, the, the um, interest, like the, just the way you accept one another gives me so much 
hope that your generation is going to do a lot better job than we did. So hang in there. It's going to be great. (laughs) Uh, Sarah, do you you have a high school teacher that like truly marked you? That's someone you could like single out right now that really, really changed your life. And and I mean, like in real life high school, not in, you know, (laughs) not in the paid high school. (laughs) Um, Actually, one of my teachers from middle school, like my last year of middle school is now one of my best friends. We reconnected after school and we became good friends. I love her to death. Um, But in high school, I would say it was Miss Schwartz and she was my creative writing teacher and she encouraged me like no one else. But she was also the first person who spoke about um, all kinds of things in a classroom setting, like the most of the things I've been learning about um, in terms of gender and sexuality that had all been online because it was all available to me at the click of a button. But she was the first one who opened up the floor and we all discussed it together. And I think that really changed me for the better. Go, Miss Schwartz. <laughs> Go, Miss Schwartz. Linda, you you once taught high school in my East End Toronto here, right? Right around the corner from here. And I, I read your book and I, you know, I I I know how important that experience was for you. Um and you've also had this unique perspective on high schools through your many generations in the other high school that you created, which you've called, and I love this, the longest running anti-bullying campaign. I, I just think that's terrific. Uh, the, the world's longest running anti-bullying yep. campaign, right? <laughs> to get Find the quote me correct. another one. I don't think so. <laughs> no, exactly. So, but of course, you know, bullying still exists. School violence still exists. And in some respects, it, you could say that it's worse than ever. What's your take on that? And how high schools and the environment in high schools have changed from the 70s to today and how you've had to reflect that in your in your art. It's been very interesting watching it through the generations because I, I related in, in your show again when you were talking with the Generation Xers about latchkey kids. And we had the first generation of parents who both parents were professional. They were both out working. This hadn't happened before in previous generations. And mom was, you know, the the homes were very much leave it to beaver. And mom was there with her lovely apron cooking up a delicious meal for the whole family to come home. Whereas with your generation, all of a sudden, we've got two parents working and we have this whole um, unheard of latchkey kid syndrome. And and what that does to kids, it gives them a new sense of freedom. And um, but do my parents really love me? Do they do? they really care. Then as we went forward, we found then there's a new kind of parenting took over. And these were the helicopter parents. And these were the ones who are lined up in front of the school, minivan after minivan, and you know, after the other, protecting the kids, not letting them walk out alone on the streets, um, starting to interfere with school curriculum, getting involved actively with, with PTAs. So I've seen such a real change over the years as how parenting has uh, influenced our kids. And and, and I I think it's really important, going back to our previous conversation, that regardless if you're um, an absentee parent, if you are a helicopter parent, you've still got to give your kids room for failure, which we talked about earlier. And, and, and that's what been one of the very important tenets of Degrassi is to uh, allow kids to make their own choices and not have adults make their choices for them, but then have to live with the consequences of it. And so, you know, and my job as a television producer has never been to say to people, this is the choice you should make. And nothing sort of brought that more to the fore than the few times we've done an episode on abortion. And our job as a television producer was to find characters who could voice the pro side, characters who could voice the other side, give them equal time. But then when our character made it a choice, they made the choice based on information at hand and they made a choice because it was what was right for them. And that that's really through across all the generations of Degrassi, the messaging that we've been trying to get across. The other side. Polarization has been around for a long time. It's been amplified lately thanks to the social media megaphone, but humans have always tended towards tribalism. And at times of great migration where masses of different cultures converge, 
this psychological trait of tribalism becomes socially and politically perilous. Populists, especially on the right, find a path to power by demonizing the other side. They sow fear and discord and a mistrust of anyone who looks and thinks differently. The gaps between us start to look unbridgeable and finding a path forward impossible. What's true? What's false? What's right? What's wrong? Do I have a choice? Do I raise my voice? Sarah, what was something you never told anyone that you actually came in on set and you just did not want to say that, you know, whether it was I didn't eat today or I've been sick all day and I don't know if people are going to catch it. What was a what was a little secret that you carried with you one day that you never told anybody? And you can tell us now. First of all, Linda, I believe that that is where your sensitivity and compassion really flourishes because I mean, you were the mother of everything. And I don't think there was a single person who worked for you that couldn't go into your office and talk to you about something. And I think you should be really proud of that. Um, (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Um, As for me, what was I thinking that I didn't tell anyone? Probably that a lot of the things I did on Degrassi, I was doing for the very first time ever, like kissing a boy, like stuff like that, that I had never even experienced in my own life that I would, you know, walk onto set and be like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And I never did. (laughs) And So in that regard, I was just terrified all the time, but because it was such a beautiful and comfortable work environment, I, my ease, ease just happened as soon as I walked in the door, but that was my biggest secret. (laughs) And on that note of being terrified all the time, I'm going to use that as the bad segue to the game show. I figured I'd get some uh, some TV questions here. This is like classic Canadian TV. You were born in Toronto, right? Yes, I was. Okay, so you you know some of this is before your time, and that's exactly the point. So I'm going to ask mm-hmm. you some questions, and if you don't know the answer, I will at you and give Linda a chance to score some points, and then I'll try to do the same thing with Linda. But I have a feeling Linda, being the pop culture guru, so connected to the mother of all everything, will get nothing wrong. But we shall oh, see. Don't set me up like that. Sorry, you ready? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Who starred as Alex P. Keaton in the 1980s hit Family Ties? Famous Canadian actor. No idea. <laughs> Linda? Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox. Who starred as Will in the groundbreaking sitcom Will and Grace? Eric McCormick. Yes. Ding. Name <laughs> a member of the legendary Canadian SCTV comedy troupe. The Legends. Oh, it was Jim Carrey one? Eh. Oh. I'll give you I'll give you one hint and then I'll give it to Linda. Uh she was in Shits Creek recently. Catherine O'Hara. Yes. And then Linda, I'll get you another point. Someone else. John Candy. John Candy. Excellent. And so many others, right? So Sarah, famous comedy duo that sprung from that show, SCTV, Bob and Doug. Junior? <laughs> Junior. I love it. Linda. <laughs> Mackenzie. <laughs> Mackenzie. Ding. Uh, Linda, bonus. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. What did Bob and Doug Mackenzie sing? Mm. A beer. A beer in a course treat. Of would be. Of course. Beer, yeah. There you go. Uh, Sarah, connection to Degrassi. Uh, the next generation, I guess. Or Yes. Uh, can, uh, Kevin Smith was part of this other famous comic duo, Jay and... Ooh, Silent, Bob. Silent Bob. Yes, Silent I'll Bob? give you a point. Okay, Got it. Great, great, okay, great, great. this is going way back. A famous Canadian comedy duo from the fifties and sixties. Wayne and oh, is this Mike Myers? No, it couldn't be. It was no, the, that's the Wayne's World. That's another yeah. era. <laughs> that's like total eighties and nineties. Linda, you know who this is. Schuster. Yes, Schuster. Uh, and Schuster. They were the like the most famous guests on. They were on Ed Sullivan all the time, right? Okay, Sarah, Oscar winner, Sarah Polly, amazing, amazing Canadian artist, got her big debut playing a young girl in which Canadian TV show? Oh, my God. It's based I... on Anne of Green Gables. Come on. Anne with an E? No. Linda? No. Mm-hmm. Was it just called Anne? No. Anne of Green Gables. No, no. Road to Avonlea. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. No one gets points for that one. Uh, recent international hit show, I mentioned it earlier, created by father and son Eugene and Dan Levy. 
Jits Creek. Jits Creek. Name a character from the Trailer Park Boys, Sarah. Oh God. One of the three. Uh, I can see him. He's got the goofy glasses, yeah. but I don't know his name. <laughs> Bubbles. Yes, Bubbles. Ricky, Julian, and Bubbles. Uh, Sarah, in the show Due South, uh, actor Paul Gross played what kind of character? What was his job? I don't know. He's wearing red. He Linda. drove a Zamboni. Drove a Zamboni. <laughs> That's a big, eh, but a good try. Linda. He's a Mountie. Okay. In the show Murdoch Mysteries, actor Yannick Bisson plays... A he's detective. Still, a detective. Good. Were you in that show? No. Oddly no, you haven't been in that one? Okay. But all my friends have. <laughs> okay. Uh, this Canadian actress made it big in the sh- on the show Baywatch. Recently Pamela released a Anderson? book too. Pamela Anderson, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> or a documentary. Cool. I'm not sure if it was a book, but anyway, heard her on the radio recently. Okay, the USA had MTV for music videos. What did Canada have? What was Canada? Much music. Much music, great. A bonus points if you know the French version of that. Much music. <laughs> <laughs> a for effort, eh, for, for no points. Uh, Linda? No, no idea. Music plus. <laughs> that makes oh, sense. Okay. Yeah, I should have known that. Yeah, yeah. A couple more. Um, Canadian actor, the first openly trans man to appear on the cover of Time magazine. Oh, I should know that. I don't know. Do you know who this is, Linda? Elliot Page. Elliot Page. That's right. <gasps> wow. Oh, that was so recent. I yeah. feel like that, that is long overdue. Actor Alan Thicke starred in which, in, to my mind, awful 80s sitcom? Oh my god. Oh god. No, I don't Father know. Father of Robin Thick. Alan Thick. Linda knows this. It's I know I can see him, but I the, honestly the title is escaping my mind. Growing pains. Mm. Yes. That's it's right. funny. In my mind, it was like that one with the, the all the three dads. What was that show called? The one with um Full House? Yeah, Full House. I for a minute there I thought it was that, but no, it was growing pains. See, Finally, I know some stuff. You know some stuff. You're gonna get lots of points, don't worry. Recent CBC all female sketch comedy show. Terrific show with some amazing talent. I wish I knew about this because I would want to be a part of it. What? Linda? Working moms? Baroness Von Sketch. Oh, the, the Von Sketch, so okay. Yeah, terrific. Yeah. Look it up. Awesome stuff. So, Ow. digital applause for you, Sarah. That was actually really, that was good. That was good. Thank you, you. you did well. well. Thanks. Okay, now it's going to be a little harder because, like, I don't think I can pull, because young people don't watch much TV anymore, Linda, so I can't really pull TV references, but I can ask you a few general questions, okay? Uh, name an American Idol winner. Kelly Clarkson. Yes. Name one of the Game of Thrones families. Couldn't. Do you know one? Sarah? Stark. Stark. Good. Name another one. I'll give you another point. Lannister. Good. Name a third. <laughs> give me a third point. Tyrell. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. There's an easy way to, you know, even the score, right? Um, okay. Which Netflix show uh, created in South Korea featured a dystopian game show where people were killed off? Which no, show is that? Sarah knows. There's a smile. Squid Game. Squid Game. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Linda, you created a show called Riverdale that I did not know, but there's another show called Riverdale, which was a spicy update of which comic book? Archie. Archie. Yeah. Easy question for you. Okay. Which Disney TV show made Selena Gomez famous? Selena Gomez. I'm not sure if Sarah knows this. Do you know this? Wizards of Waverly Place. Okay. You get the point. <laughs> Finally, here's a softball to you. Linda, who lives in a pineapple under the sea? <laughs> SpongeBob. There's the perfect guess. You got it. <laughs> with a musical oh guess. Sarah, would you have guessed that one too? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. She says with a frown, like, duh, of course I would guess that. The last thing I'm going to ask you, because normally interviews, Linda, start with someone asking about Drake. And uh, you notice I stayed away from from Aubrey. Um, but I'm just curious, in the, the worlds that you have created for Degrassi, uh, that is one obvious success story. There have been so many people who've gone on to do so many remarkable things. Maybe just list a few of the Degrassi children, kids that you are proud of and who, who people may not have heard of as they might have heard of Drake. Well, first of all, Miss Wayglass is sitting I mean, there she's right here. Now. That goes without saying. <laughs> oh my God, um, Linda, you're proud of me? Oh my 
is that me? Of course I am. <laughs> you're on a Netflix hit show and you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Um, <laughs> There's Jake Epstein, who has done such amazing work in uh, Broadway, and he he's done a one act play, a one man play that you should see, Rick. Um, Jake's done really well. He was in uh, Spider Man, right? I think he was floating above my head on Broadway. He was yeah, in that 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 accident fraught um, Broadway show, the Julie yes. Taymor show with Bono and the Edge. That that was a hot mess, but fun <laughs> to, fun to see uh, fun to see Jake above my head. <laughs> And then, of course, we've got Nina Dobrev, who went on to do the you know, Vampire Diaries. But it's not just the kids in front of my camera who I'm really proud of. I'm also really proud of what a lot of my writers and directors have gone on to do. And you mentioned the show Riverdale that, yes, I did the Canadian version. But one of the writers from Degrassi, uh, my, Michael Grassi from Degrassi, ended up being the showrunner on Riverdale. Aaron Martin's got a number of shows that he's had on Netflix and CBC. So... I've got uh, directors who have gone on. So it's really wonderful for me to just sort of see the Degrassi family fan out, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera as well. You're you're such wonderful people. I was so glad to get to know each of you a little bit, and I'm so grateful for the interview. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. Hope you had fun. Pleasure. It's been a pleasure and fun. Yes. (laughs) Hope you had fun too, friends. As always, I'd like to thank my two guests, Linda Schuyler and Sarah Waysglass. You can catch Sarah on Netflix and Ginny and Georgia, and I strongly encourage you to read Linda's memoir, The Mother of All Degrassi. My name is Rick Miller, and I wrote, recorded, and edited this episode with multimedia by my team at Kadoons. For more about the Boom Trilogy and our many other projects, visit kadoons.com or boomtheshow.com. Thanks also, as always, to my partners on this podcast, Leap, an online community where life experience meets innovation, created by CABI, the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. For more info or to become a Leap member, visit cabbycom slash leap. If you're on a podcast player, please follow us, write a review, tell someone about this or other episodes you liked. You can also send me any questions, comments, or feedback, Rick Miller Actor on Twitter or Instagram, or email rick at rickmiller.ca. And hey, in a polarized world, you have a choice. Build a wall or build a bridge. Build bridges, not walls. Xing the gap.